the reason why uh, why there is such a hype about artificial intelligence uh, in the community now because people think that artificial intelligence can do everything and whatever type of chemist you are there will be a possibility for the applications of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence to help you in your processes machine learning Artificial intelligence, big data, they're all the rage these days, but what do these terms really mean? And what are the realities behind the myths and hype? Can machine learning actually help scientists? Hi, I'm Karis. And I'm Jesse, and we're the hosts of The Analytical Wavelength, a podcast about chemical information and data, brought to you by ACD Labs. In this season, we're going to be exploring the role that predictive tools play in chemical and pharmaceutical research. For our first episode, we want to provide an introduction to machine learning, what it is, what it can do, and how it might be applied specifically in chemistry. To answer these questions, I spoke with Valeri Tachenko, CEO and president of Science Data Experts, who specialize in developing machine learning tools for chemists. Let's hear what he had to say. Joining me today is Valeri from Science Data Experts. How are you doing, Valeri? Doing pretty good, thank you. Good, good. Here to talk to us about an introduction to AI and machine learning in uh, the chemical sciences. So I want to start off with our icebreaker question. What is your favorite chemical? <laughs> That's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> After some short thinking, I would say it's a beer. Mm. Does it count as a chemical? Uh, ethanol counts as a chemical. You can, you can choose ethanol. Yeah, but, you know, beer is better than ethanol. <laughs> <laughs> got it, got it. <laughs> I don't think that the straight ethanol is particularly appetizing. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. Um, so I uh, wanted to start off by kind of defining some general terms. Topics like predictions and machine learning are uh, pretty popular right now, uh, but there's some confusions about what these different terms mean. And you can even see this with some experts that have some gray area of how they define some of these you know, core terms. Uh, so how would you define a term uh, machine learning? You may be surprised, but I, I mean, I, I, I keep forgetting what machine learning is. And once in a while, I Google it. And the variety of answers that I get back from the Google pages is really striking. And uh, I'll try to answer as as good as I can, but it doesn't mean that it's the final answer because I don't believe their final one answer exists. So machine learning is something like uh, simulation by machines, the uh, human intelligence. Normally, it's considered to be the computer systems uh, which can simulate uh, the human intelligence. And uh, then it's, it's a whole variety of what you're trying to do from, um, from the understanding of the natural language, texts, images, so whatever. Whatever has resemblance, whatever resemblance can machines provide uh, mimicking what human can do. That's probably the biggest term uh, when it comes to the definition of what machine learning is. Okay. And then how would that differ from something like statistics, which is used to do some similar things? It's another good question. And so my, and again, uh, some time ago, I tried to find the answer on the internet. And basically, I even came up to some papers in pretty respectable journals like Nature, Nature Methods. And uh, the scholars are arguing what uh, was the difference between machine learning and statistics. So unless we want to go into that gray area, what they say, I would, I would state that, well, statistics is a, is a tool which machine learning is using to to draw its results. So at the end, it comes to, st to statistical models because all, all the predictions that machine learning is making, it's, it's based on probabilistic or statistical models. So but let's say statistics, it's a, it's a tool. Great. And then how does machine learning and statistics differ from artificial intelligence, which is another term that's thrown in there? Uh, that's a bit easier. So everything that is startling where machines are trying to mimic uh, human intelligence called artificial intelligence. So that, that's a big, big, big area. Subdomain of that area is machine learning. And uh, the recent hype about machine learning is actually connected to the development in, in the area of uh, neural networks. And that's a smaller area than uh, machine learning. So basically if you, and that's, that's a pretty popular uh, picture which you can often see the large, 
large circle is artificial intelligence, then the smaller one inside is machine learning, and yet smaller one inside is deep learning. And this is where from deep learning on all the hype is coming out these days. Great. And then uh, how about big data? Is that part of that same set of circles or is that something that's separate? It's, it, it's absolutely separate, but it's connected uh, until we had a big data. Until we had access to the big data, the machine learning was learning slowly. So <laughs> the, the more the merrier. Mm hmm. And a lot of these concepts are becoming much more popular right now. You're kind of talking a little bit about that. So, like, why is it that there's so much interest in this area these days? Uh, these days, and, and probably we need to step step back just a bit. So, you mentioned you asked the question about big data. So, what's big data? Where this big data come from? Let's let's look back thirty years ago. Uh, we already had internet. That, that's about the, the time when we got internet 32, 33 years ago. So the the first decade of the internet was uh, just to tune tune the things up. The websites were appearing, uh, they were sharing some data, uh, but uh, the, it was the infancy years of the internet. Then as technology started to mature, we got more and more data coming. And now we live in a world of the big data, I mean that everybody, uh, Everybody can share their, their knowledge, their information, their data, whether they're assembled in, in the laboratory or that's some uh, life experience. Everybody's sharing on the social media everywhere. And uh, the proliferation of this data is huge. So why didn't we learn? Why didn't we use um, machine learning term before? Because, well, in some respect, it's, it's not that the only, it's not the single answer. In some respect, there wasn't enough data. Now we get, thanks to internet, now we get enough data to, to build the statistical models. Great. So it's a tie in between those two, uh, the, the big data and the machine learning. That sounds uh, excellent. And, and many other things which mm. we shall probably um, talk about later. Of course. Um, okay. So these are all your know, introductions to these topics that are you know, general to the discussions about machine learning. Um, but I want to talk to this specifically about chemistry. Uh, which of these uh, concepts or, or practices relates to machine learning and artificial intelligence in chemistry? Uh, well, all of them. We, the reason why, uh, why there is such a hype about artificial intelligence uh, in the community now, because people think that artificial intelligence can do everything, uh, depending on what type of chemist you are. You're an analytical chemist, you're a synthetic chemist, you're... And whatever type of chemist you are, there will be a possibility for the applications of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence to help you in your processes. Okay. So I think that probably a good way to understand that actually might be going through a bit of an example of how machine learning works. Let's imagine a company came to you and asks you in, in your company to design a tool to predict something like solubility of organic molecules, for example, pretty straightforward. How would you go about creating something like this? What are the steps involved in creating a machine learning you know, algorithm or a tool that uses machine learning? Well, probably the good way to understand how machine how machines are doing it, uh, because as I mentioned before, machines are mimicking the human intelligence. So if you're a human, if you're a chemist, and you obviously whatever you you're a lab chemist, you're concerned with uh, solubility in this case. So you're you're a chemist with years of experience of working with the chemicals, and you're looking at the formula of that chemicals. What will you see there? Uh, benzene, for example, toluene. I don't know, some spirits, are they soluble or not? Well, if, if the molecule is polar, then likely it's going to be soluble. If it's not, then not. Basically, you are drawing conclusions, uh, breaking down the molecule in, into the functional groups. And uh, those uh, functional groups in, in machine learning terms are called features or descriptors or fingerprints. So most of the machine learning methods, and I'm saying most because uh, some, um, some development in um, neural, neural networks allow you to escape this, this common route. But uh, most of the machine learning methods are working in the way that they first, with a human help, for example, uh, they design this set of uh, characteristics of the molecule. In this case, it's a molecule. What kind of functional groups your molecule is comprised of? Uh, what are the bigger fragments? What are the atoms? What are 
polarity of, of the molecules, etc. So let's assume you have uh, the whole set of these descriptors. And you pass this um, set of descriptors through the learning algorithm. What's happening inside, in most cases, it's, it's a black box. Sometimes it's not. For example, linear regression means that you are just calculating the co coefficients which, which will describe your model. Uh, in term, when it comes to neural networks, it's, uh, it's absolutely black box. You feed something in, you get something out. How it works inside, it can be explainable. That's by the way, the area, uh, relatively new area, which is called explainable AI, which we can talk about a bit later. Uh, but in most cases, machine learning models are uh, black boxes. So what you have, you have given a molecule, but in reality, to train machine learning algorithm, you need to have lots of molecules because uh, ML learns the, the more the merrier. The more data you have, the better the results. Normally, not always. There are always also exceptions. That that's not a true statement, absolutely true statement. But basically, you're, you're feeding, you're breaking down, let's say, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 molecules in those fragments, and you know the solubility of those molecules. So there is a machine with a, with a loop. Data is coming in. You're comparing what's, what's out with uh, the desired, desired outcome. If there is a difference, then you retrain the model and, and so forth. So you keep passing these molecules through and you, you're inside, uh, something is growing up. And that something is, is the tuned uh, machine learning model. When the model is tuned, and tuned means that uh, the, the, it shouldn't be subjective. Uh, there should be some objective criteria, like the metrics. Uh, machine learning comes with the metrics. How, how good the model? Well, the better the metrics, the better the, the, the model is. So once this uh, training stage is passed inside that black box, uh, you have something tuned up and working. And then when you want to predict the property of the new molecule, the, not necessarily water solubility, whatever. Uh, so you just pass that molecule and the same process uh, repeats itself. So that molecule has been broken into exactly the same fragments as we used previously, which are called descriptors. And then the magic inside this black box happens. And as an output, you get your desired property. As, as simple as that. Okay, that's uh, good. So a lot of it then comes down to the design of the actual learning components that are in the, uh, that's taking that training set and developing the, the model around that. Actually not, because, uh, uh, and it's probably better being seen when you, uh, well, let, let's say the most popular language right now uh, for machine learning, artificial intelligence is, is Python. And in Python, it's just one line of the code. So you, you have the inputs and you know your outputs and you call just one method, which is called fit. And regardless of what, uh, uh, what machine learning algorithm is inside, it can be SVM support vector machines, it can be linear regression, it can be classification algorithms, anything, you just say fit. So, and, and the intrinsics, intrinsics and details of how the, the stuff is trained inside is, is absolutely hidden from you. Mm -hmm. That's why so many people are, are jumping these days on machine learning because uh, seemingly without any, uh, any understanding of, of the details of what you are doing, you can produce great results. Okay, that's that's pretty interesting uh, element of it. Didn't realize that. So uh, I think that there are a bunch of misconceptions though around AI and ML. We've touched on some of this and this is both exists within popular culture and within the scientific community as well. Uh, so I wanted to kind of like read off a few like statements or ideas and kind of get your you know, reaction to them to say whether like this is this is a myth or this is overhyped or that there's some truth to this. So, you know, first one, um, interest in AI is very new and it's just a fad. Well, I guess both statements are, are false because uh, AI Artificial neural networks, neural networks, uh, which can do incredible things, self-driving cars, uh, natural language processing. It's all based on, on the elements, which is called perceptron. And perceptron was introduced, uh, I believe, more than 60 years ago. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, and, <laughs> not particularly new, that's, not, that's for sure. No, not particularly new, yeah. Uh, but the problem was the computing power was not as great as, as we have now. Uh, and uh, the algorithms uh, which we currently have uh, accessible to us were not good. Uh, that's why the first decades, I would say four decades, 
of existence of perceptron was not producing any 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 big results. And only only like 15 years ago, there was um, so co computers were became pretty powerful, and then the algorithm, which is called backpropagation, was developed, and that and and of course the big data. So that allows us to have what we have now with artificial intelligence. Great. Uh, now, this is uh, one that relates to things that we kind of talked about before. So AI is a black box. You can't learn anything from understanding actual chemistry using AI. That's also not true. Uh, yes, I, uh, I'm i guilty myself. I'm, I'm, I keep telling that, AI, uh, well, machine learning AI is a black box uh, because in, in many cases, you don't understand how it works inside, especially in, in terms of um, artificial neural networks. Uh, but in reality, in, in my example, when we're considering uh, how soluble the substance is, uh, what I said, we are breaking it down into components. If, if, it's, if it's a polar molecule, then there is a good chance that uh, the molecule will be soluble. And so on and so forth. If you are talking about uh, docking, about affinity of, of some small molecules to, to the large protein molecules, uh, it's again, it's the shape of the molecule, which can be derived from from the presence or absence of the functional groups and their connectivity. And as I said, that there is there is a direction which is called explainable AI, uh, which is trying, despite the fact that not what's happening inside that, that, that box is, is not always known, uh, there is a direction which tries to do exactly that. And there are, there are ways around. It, just explainable AI is, is a huge topic to talk about. With large enough data sets, AI can make accurate predictions about anything. The quality of the data is less important than the quantity. Well, that's absolutely not true. And there's a statement uh, which sounds like junk in, junk out. So it, it, it heavily depends on what kind of data you're feeding inside your, your learning algorithm. And the quantity obviously is not, not the critical issue. It, it, it is, uh, the, the more, the more Diverse, and the, the key word here is diverse. The more diverse data you have, uh, the better you can expect to train your um, algorithm. Uh, but, uh, uh, and here, we, by the way, when I mentioned the metrics, so the quality of the model is estimated by, by the set of automated, uh, automatically calculated uh, numbers. Uh, one of those numbers is called applicability domain. So let's assume you are training your molecules on on not very diverse set, meaning let, let's say it's uh, benzene rings, uh, fused benzene rings, many of them, different combinations. And then you're trying to predict um, the solubility of um, completely different type of the molecule, linear chains. It's quite intuitively that uh, the model you've, you've trained on aromatic rings will not work well on, on this aliphatic chains. That's why that's pretty much direct answer. So the, the data means a lot and uh, yeah, junk in, junk out. Great. And then another one that is very common, I think, in popular culture as well, is that AI is going to be taking everybody's jobs, both in you know the society generally and in chemistry and the pharmaceutical industry between uh, machine learning and robots. Uh, everything's going to be automated sooner or later. What do you think about that? <laughs> I'm trying to scare my son uh, when I'm saying, well, in another few years, machines will take your job from you. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, well, not, not in the near future. There is, there is a line, that there is a scope of where the machine learning algorithms are applicable right now. And the near future, I don't know, five, 10 years, despite all, all the great thing that they're able to do, uh, there is no danger of machines taking uh, jobs from people. Although when you're looking at the Boston Dynamics robots, you know, doing parkour and uh, other <laughs> kinds of things, you, you can think, yeah, that's just, just a couple of years and I, I will lose mine. But remember that the, the chemists are scientists. The, the scientist is defined as a person with a critical and analytical thinking. And this is where, hmm. this is where the, the gap is probably because machine learning can learn can mimic the, the regular behavior, the, some, some patterns which uh, can visually percept it from the data. But the science always stands apart from, from that obvious things. 
I, I would say that it's not so much maybe that people's jobs are going to disappear, but people's jobs might change, particularly in the sciences as these become more advanced. Well, that's already happening. I mean, just yeah. just, just look around. The, the the same process. Well, solubility is a simple case, but the the process of uh, you know new new drug discovery. Uh, it's all based on QSR, and QSR is machine learning. It's uh, pure implementation. Great. Now, uh, with that, uh, I think that that's covered a lot of uh, great introductory material on this topic. But I wanted to ask you if there was anything else that you wanted to add here uh, for our audience that you think is useful for them to know on the subject of uh, machine learning and chemistry. Oh, that's pretty much open question. We can talk for another few few hours about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the area, the area is huge and uh, the breakthroughs are happening literally every day. Uh, I, I've started... Uh, I focused on machine learning just a few years ago, actually, despite the fact that I, I've been um, working in this domain for a while, but uh, machine learning has became my focus just a few years ago. And uh, it's it's literally every day some new paper comes out and, and the new possibilities are are being developed. And uh, I think it's, a, for, especially for the young scientists, it's, it's a very good uh, area to focus in. I'll agree with that. Well, thank you so much, Valeria. It's been lovely to chat with you. It's very informative. And uh, yeah, it, it was uh, yeah, great to learn from you. Thank you, Jess. Valeria gave us some great examples of how machine learning might help advance chemistry and complement the results of scientific experiments. Yes. And that point about complementing experiments is, I think, very important. Machine learning isn't going to replace scientists or scientific jobs. Definitely. It's better and I think more reassuring to think of it as a tool in our toolbox. And in our next episode, we'll learn how that tool can be used to predict chemical properties and toxicity so we can reduce our reliance on animal experiments. Remember to subscribe so you know when it goes live. This is The Analytical Wavelength. Until next time. The Analytical Wavelength is brought to you by ACD Labs. We create software to help scientists make the most of their analytical data by predicting molecular properties, and by organizing and analyzing their experimental results. To learn more, please visit us at www.acdlabs.com.